Welcome to Everything Under the Moon. I'm Mel. And I'm Stephanie. In 1901, Charlotte Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain visited the gardens of Versailles. After a dreamlike afternoon, the women concluded they had encountered a haunting of the infamous queen herself, Marie Antoinette. After 10 years of research, they published their experiences and claims in An Adventure. In this short book, the women claim to have traveled back in time to the year 1789. Did these women really slip through time, or were they merely lost in the wooded acres of Versailles? Join us tonight as we investigate their claims. Welcome! Welcome, Steph. Thanks, Mel. I'm excited to be here. Stell is currently, you know, in another country, like doing witchcraft and playing with Ouija boards and stuff. So <laughs> for 2022, we're going to kind of start a new theme and start having some guest co-hosts on because I honestly think you all would get bored just listening to me talk to myself, <laughs> although I never do. So it's an honor. <laughs> yeah. So Steph is my sister and we're best buds. So <laughs> I think we have a great rapport and she's really into the crazy wacky paranormal stuff too so the ghost stories scare me too much but the mysterious events are really fun give you the goosebumps so we're going to be talking tonight about what's commonly called the Jordan uh, Moberly incident and that uh, those are the surnames of the two women involved so these two women uh, visited Versailles in 1901 and had a really creepy experience. They published a book about their experience. They spent 10 years researching it and eventually came to the conclusion that they experienced some type of haunting. And so we're gonna kind of dive into their experience and then give our own little conclusions about it. And what's really cool about this story that kind of drew me to it is, you know, the rumors that they're gay. Because, and I think that has so much to do with how they were perceived. So both of them were spinsters, you know, quote, unquote, I kind of hate that, but they were unmarried <laughs> women, uh, career women who were well-educated. And you'd think like today, if that happened, that would make them more credible, right? Yeah, but, like just two powerhouse women running a whole school by themselves. Not really, but... I mean, they did, but in 1901, it was like, oh, it's two women who own a vacation home together. <laughs> Sketchy. So you definitely have to take that into consideration when seeing how the public reacted to what they said happened. And I feel like maybe some things were left out because they didn't want to say, I looked into my lover's eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, because they're editing their own story. Exactly. They published their own book. And it wasn't cool to be out back then. <laughs> no, it was a death sentence in some places. I mean, yeah. I don't know for women, but for men especially. And we'll kind of, we'll talk about this a little later, but there are more gay characters in the story. Uh, a man came out in the 60s and claimed that him and other friends, you know, in their own little kind of closeted community would go to Versailles and put on plays. And he was like, she might have seen us putting on a play mm. and they didn't tell the people at Versailles they were doing it because they didn't want to be outed. They were just trying to have fun. Yeah, they were just like a theater troupe kind of. It's really interesting and the culture and time that this took place in is really important to the story. And it's kind of a like when you Google time travel now or like creepy stories about time travel, this always pops up. So Yeah. I I've read through this story like twice now. I've really done my best to try and accurately account for what happened physically. And I still don't know where I'm landing with this. It's some very strange things that just don't add up. But at the same time, it's not so strange. They weren't abducted by aliens. They didn't see bright lights in the sky. So it's hard to say one way or the other. Yeah, and I feel the same way. Like, there's two or three things I think could be plausible. Yeah. And of course, it's like everything else we talk about. You'll never know. <laughs> but there's a few things that just like raise little tiny 
orange flags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's a little strange. It's a yellow light. It's like, slow down. <laughs> slow down. Let's think about this. <laughs> but it's not so absurd that they're, they're not clearly hallucinating. They're not clearly transported to another land. It's just bizarre. They also have zero reason to hoax any of this. Yeah, what are they going to gain by putting themselves out in the spotlight? (laughs) Yeah, and if you were going to hoax something like this, this is like a pretty lame one. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's not like a ghost, like, attacked them. You know, it's not like a scary, like, romantic type of thing. During this time period, what was the public's view on sort of ghost stories and that kind of spiritual... So... You know, this is 1901. This is, I don't know if it's technically the Edwardian area, era yet. I'd call it the Victorian era, I think. Okay. Um, and Victorian people as a whole, you know, I am not an expert on this, caveat. <laughs> but they were really into ghost stories. You know, like yeah. the ghost of Christmas past, you know, telling ghost stories on Christmas tradition came from this time. Wasn't that also the time period with those faked seance pictures? Yes. Of the big orbs and stuff, the mm-hmm. ghostly people. Yeah, as soon as photography became a thing, people started taking spiritualist <laughs> photos. And so I'm really into Mary Todd Lincoln. And she famously took a picture of, uh, with the ghost, quote, of Abe Lincoln. And she Ooh. based it, she went to a spiritual photographer and was like, hey, I had this experience with my husband's ghost. I want you to recreate it in a photo. Gotcha. So that kind of stuff was really popular. Um, spiritualism is, it's not its heyday necessarily, but it's still there. Like this is the era, the Victorian era is like the invention of the Ouija board mm-hmm. and the invention of, you know, the parlor tricks and seances. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, you know, you can tell that in this place that they bring, you know, they bring this story forward. I forget who they actually sent it to. I hope I have it written down. (laughs) But they, like, after they realize what they think they've experienced, Mm -hmm. they write down their experiences and send them to, like, an academic group, like, of... It's got, like, a Victorian name, like, the Society for Psychological (laughs) Phenomenon Research or something. But they're not afraid. You know, they're not, like, hush-hush about it. They tell everyone they get to listen to them about it. And, um... This is a great way to segue into their backgrounds. So our first character in the story is Charlotte Ann Moberly. She's born in 1846 in Winchester, England, and her father served as the Bishop of Salisbury. Um, I had to do a little bit of research on the Church of England because I know nothing. <laughs> because I was like, how important is the Bishop of Salisbury? And like, yeah. you know, what, what kind of life does she have? Is she like adjacent to the royal family? Turns out, no. <laughs> so... Bishops supervise, like, all the clergy in their little area, and they Mm kind of, like, serve on a board to make decisions for the church. They are pretty high up there. Mm -hmm. It's not a... It's nothing to laugh at. But they weren't rich by any means, although they were, you know, we would call them wealthy. Anyway, uh, her mother is described... (laughs) So I got their their biographies off of Oxford's uh, website, and because they both worked at Oxford University, so I thought that was a great source. And they describe her mother as beautiful and educated in Italy. Like, what a weird... Beautifully educated. (laughs) Beautiful, educated, spoke Italian and drank wine. Like, (laughs) I take that to mean, like, she was beautiful and she was beautifully educated. I love it. (laughs) Because Italy, everything's in cursive and it's beautiful. (laughs) Charlotte and her family were of English and Scottish descent. And uh, her biography, it specifically mentions that her father did not deny... The existence of ghosts to her. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are a couple ghost stories passed down in her family. Her maternal family claimed to be able to commune with spirits. And that's kind of the Scottish side of her family. So it just gives me like Outlander vibes. You know, like I hear bagpipes and I'm like, ooh, ghosts. I feel like Um, all of Europe is more ghost riddled than America is. She, you know, definitely wouldn't have grown up being a skeptic. Mm Mm-hmm. Charlotte is described as, uh, her childhood is described as devout, um, but liberal, and they call it a high Anglican upbringing, which I think is pretty classic. You know, these are like royal adjacent people. I think of Princess Diana. Like, although Charlotte wasn't titled, she wasn't a lady, she definitely had probably the same type of life. She didn't even go to prep school. No? She was educated at home by her mother, and she had a governess. 
Okay, um, she was really rich. She had a governess. Exactly. Her brothers did go to school, of course. She used to sit in on her brother's lessons mm -hmm. and learn what they were learning. And so, she, and she was described as bookish as a child, which I think is really cute. And she was fluent as an adult. She was fluent in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And that was from like sitting in on her, her brother's lessons. Her brothers oh. would all also go into the church. That's a strange mix. That was really common at the time. Hmm. In classic academics, even in the 1700s, the sons of important men were learning Latin and Greek and Hebrew. And it's kind of a, um, you know, Hebrew is because it's like biblical, mm -hmm. Latin is because of the church. So. And Greek was just for fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, we've got like a Greek fetish in Western society. Like we're all about the Greeks. Yeah, so she attended her brother's lessons and studied on her own time. They kind of skip forward in her biography until she's 40. They say she was a home daughter until 40, so mar unmarried essentially, mm -hmm. but living at home like a good Christian woman does. And she actually acted as her father's secretary when he became a bishop, so that's kind of cool. Uh, after her father died, uh, her family was a little worried, you know, that that was their income, and she also had other sisters living at home. So her father is oh. supporting her grown sisters still. And as kind of a way to a gesture of goodwill, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Woodsworth, who is the sister of the new Bishop of Salisbury, so the guy who replaced her dad, she is the principal of a girls' school called Lady Margaret Hall, and she invites uh, Charlotte to come run a new school. So she's kind of like, hey, we're both professional women. I know your family needs some income. Yeah. Come run this new school. And... She's reluctant to leave. She doesn't necessarily want to leave her family home, but uh, she does. And she called it St. Hugh's Hall. And it was actually just like an auxiliary building off the side of the Lady Margaret Hall at first. Mm -hmm. And she started with four students. <laughs> By the time she retires in 1915, the hall was known as St. Hugh's College and it enrolled 60 students. So she built that school. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. They credit her gentility and impeccable orthodoxy with winning the confidence of Anglican parents who held conservative views on women's education. So the way I view Charlotte, I don't think she was necessarily like, of course she was smart. I don't think she was this crazy qualified academic, mm -hmm. but she had this credibility because of her upbringing and her, yeah. you know, good graces that allowed these other women to get educations. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. Because you don't have to be a genius to do good in the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so um, in 1901, of course, is their experience. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit in her biography. But, but she retires in 1915 when she's 69 years old. And uh, she served on the college board and was made an honorary, honorary master in 1920 when women were allowed to obtain them. So Oxford's like, hey, now women are allowed to have master's degrees. You, you can, can have, have one. one. Yeah. <laughs> How sweet. Uh, and she passes away in her home at the age of 90 on May 5th, 1937. So she has a nice long life. And that's, think about that. That's crazy. Like she was born in 1846, like yeah. at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And she passes away like six years before we fight the Nazis <laughs> or begin to think about the Nazis. So that's pretty cool. So that's Charlotte. And she is... Uh, the older of the two women in this story. So what do you think about Charlotte? Her reputation with the community strikes me as making her a reputable witness. If she has such a high standing in the school, her father had high standing. It doesn't seem like this is a family of crazy people who yeah, go around and fake things and try and con people for money, essentially, you know? Exactly. I was going to say there's no reason for her to want, like, fame and fortune. Like, she's exactly. already got the reputation. She... she already has this cush job at a school, which she keeps her entire life. Mm -hmm. It's not affected by this incident. Yeah, and Eleanor is, they definitely are, they act as foils towards each other. Mm -hmm. Which is, I think, a little bit too why I think it's so romantic. Like, I want to believe they were in love because they're kind of a little, they're opposites. Uh, so let's talk about Eleanor. Eleanor is born a little while later. I didn't actually do the math of their births. Let's see, 46, 63. So it's almost 20 years between mm -hmm. them. Uh, but Eleanor Jordan is born in 1863 in Derbyshire, England. And that's kind of north of London. Her father was also uh, in the church. 
Her father was a reverend, and later he became the vicar or vicar of Ashburn. And so I also looked up what that was. (laughs) And a vicar is a type of, like, local priest. So not as important as a bishop, Mm -hmm. but, you know, like a, like we would call a, a pastor, maybe, in America. Is there a huge number of churches in England? That's what I assume. Yes. Yeah, like, so they have really, especially at this time, like, counties are really small. I think Charlotte's father, like, loses his bishopship. One of them loses it because they're merging counties Ah. together, merging parishes. And the Church of England has its own entire structure. (laughs) It's, like, really (laughs) ancient. Like, it's kind of cool. Like, the Bishop of Salisbury, I was looking at all of the bishops of Salisbury that have ever been, and the first one was in, like, 1100. Yeah. (laughs) And it's just, like, a list. They can list every single one and, like, what he did. I'm not crazy about the medieval church, of course, but it, their record-keeping skills were sick. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The Oxford biography describes their family as poor, proud, talented, of Huguenot descent. So Huguenots were banished Catholics from France um, a couple hundred years, you know, in the past. So they're not direct immigrants, but, but they were not as well off as the Moberly family. But they were very well educated, nevertheless. Uh, Eleanor attended a day school and Lady Margaret Hall in 1883. So that's the school that, you know, Charlotte is working adjacent to. So she's in this social circle. And her maternal grandparents paid for that. So uh, that's kind of, you know, they, they justify. They're like, yeah, well, they were poor, but her grandparents slid her some money for that education. And Eleanor is well educated. She is one of the first women ever examined in modern history at Oxford, and she placed second in her class. She was incredibly talented when it came to music, literature, art, um, and she, you know, seemed to be this Renaissance society woman, but she wanted a career, so she became a teacher, which was really, you know, all women could do, respectively, with her background. Did they have mixed classes back then, or was this just a woman's class that she was graded in? Yeah, so, like, the reason it's not just, like, we don't just say they went to Oxford is because it's technically, like, they went to Oxford College, but they went to a separate building (laughs) called the Harder Hall, you know? So, yeah, no no mixed education. She was described by a former pupil as a born teacher. She would work as a headmistress before founding her own private boarding and day school for girls called Koran Collegiate School. She just works her way up, and eventually she gets up with a bunch of other women, and she's like, let's just start our own school. Yeah. And by 1900, the school enrolled more than 100 students. So her school surpassed Charlotte's enrollment numbers. And she started from the dirt. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And 20 years later, like she's almost 20 years younger. So she's really successful. And after this school kind of takes off, she rents, uh, it's called a Rive Gauche, Rive Gauche flat in Paris. I don't know what that means. It's a fancy apartment in Paris. Uh, And they kind of uh, plan for that to be somewhere that older girls from their school can come from England to study in Paris, study French. Because Eleanor was interested in France or in French. (laughs) She She was a tutor of the French language. Yeah, it does sound really fun, right? Way old-fashioned foreign. Yeah, exactly. Like, come to Paris and we'll we'll go look at the Louvre. Is that how you say it? <laughs> but first, you know, the first summer she buys this apartment, she is just inviting friends to come stay with her. Girlfriends, you might say. Quote, quote. You can't see my looks right now. but That adds a bit of a ungayness. <laughs> that makes it seem less like they were in a relationship if she intended the apartment for other students to come and stay. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. And it's a fellow I, teacher, too. So it could be, yeah. hey, look at these new innovative things my school is doing. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of the way that she frames it herself. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious because in none of my research did I ever find record of a girl going to the apartment, like a school girl. You know what I mean? Like it kind of just seems like she was like, oh, this is for my school, and then she vacationed there. But I, you know, I didn't, I'm, we did not do exhaustive research. I don't know. You'll see later on what we're talking about, just meaningful eye contact kind of things. <laughs> yeah. And they were roommates. Um, so this is where they're staying in this apartment when they have their experience at Versailles. After the incident in Versailles, she actually leaves her own school that she helped found 
she takes a position of vice principal and French tutor at St. Hugh's. So she leaves her school and goes to Charlotte's school and works directly under her. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which you could say is just because she wanted to write her book and all of that, but... Yeah, you it's a step letters. down <laughs> in status. Like, it's a yeah. step down in status and income. And in the Oxford, like, biography, they're like, well, it was rewarded 12 years later when she became the principal after Moberly retired. And it's like... So she That's took not her a ex-girlfriend's job. Her yeah, girlfriend's and, and job. she took a pay cut for 12 years of the prime of her career. For what? I don't know. Maybe to be with the woman she left? Maybe. That's um, what makes it seem romantic. Exactly. Yeah, there's just a lot of, like, incidents yeah. of, like, think of that personally. Like, I did that for my husband. This stage of her life saw her as a distinguished and charming woman. That's a direct quote, so I just love her. But she led suffragette demonstrations in London in her doctoral robes. She helped St. Hugh's College expand from 50 students who were there when she started to over 150. So she kind of builds this legacy with Charlotte. Her critics, she had lots of critics, as we all do, they saw her as domineering and manipul manipulative and incapable of self-criticism, which, like, fair. So she becomes pretty controversial when her judgment becomes erratic. So... There's a certain point in her college's history where the female tutors and female employees are suddenly allowed to make decisions. Like they get put on the board and they're allowed to make decisions in how the college governs and works. And she was for this in spirit, but she really resisted it in practice. You know, she shot down their ideas, wouldn't let, let other women be, women be in charge. Strange. What a strange and, uh, dynamic. It is. It's, it's internalized misogyny is what it sounds like. You know, like, I'm in charge, but other women are But I'm are a strong enough. woman. Exactly, because I'm me. <laughs> it's called the St. Hugh's Row. They, like, gave this whole, co this whole controversy a name. Row and fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she let one of her female tutors go because her female, like, that tutor was trying to, I don't know, have more power or something. And all of the other female tutors resigned in protest as well as six council members <laughs> they all went Oof. on strike <laughs> what a mess and so she basically you know all the tutors go on strike the school is like this huge upheaval and she is told that she is expected to resign and she it's really sad she hears this news and she has a heart attack and dies so she did not have a very happy ending and she passes away April 6th, 1924. So Charlotte actually outlived Eleanor. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is sad. And on, you know, Oxford really, they really admire her legacy. They say, you know, she worked in World War I, translating and deciphering government documents. She was one of the first women to hold lectures at Oxford. She was one of the first women to examine undergrads. Because I guess even in the women's schools, they would still have the men come in and give, you know, like the oral examinations or whatever. <laughs> so dumb. And she was the president of the Modern Language Association. So she was very, very well respected. And they even say, a lot of people said, you know, after she passed away, like, if she had ended her career two years earlier, <laughs> she would have been written in stone. It's just something, we don't know if she got older, you know, and she's kind of lost it a little bit, or if. You know, maybe just bad situation, bad choices. But, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of... It's kind problem. of complicated. It's, it's very complicated. Because she only seems to really have that problem with one person, and then it blows way out of proportion. Yeah, and, it, you know, we're just reading this 100 years later. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it could have been an entirely other thing. There are rumors, like, on other biography pages that... Eleanor would sometimes have inappropriate relationships with some of the girls she was tutoring. And that's another thing that feeds into the, the rumors of her being gay. But, but that's also kind of a slander thing. So do I believe that, you know, because yeah. they're not saying that to say she was gay. They're saying that to discredit her because she's gay, you know. So clearly both of these women were really accomplished. And I believe them to be credible. I mean, those biographies are not, uh, those accomplishments are not to be laughed at. Um, this happens, their experience at Versailles happens in 1901, and it's probably the zenith of Jourdain's career. I mean, she's like right in the center of it. She's a co-founder of that successful girls' academy outside of London. 
Mm-hmm. She had a vacation home in Paris. That's that's pretty impressive, you know, for her, for a single woman in 1901. Moberly is in the middle of her career, too. She's the principal of St. Hugh's College at the time. She's building attendance, and she had a really rep, uh, a reputable reputation. That sounds weird. <laughs> she was respected as an educator. So what I'm trying to say is that both of these women had a lot to lose, uh, if this is a silly hoax or a lie. They don't have husbands to fall back on. Yeah. This is their full-time life. <laughs> yeah, this is real life to them. And they're two smart, capable women. These are not lost chickens who can't find their way through Versailles. You know, like because that's yeah. very much kind of a skeptic, like a thing the skeptics want you to believe is that these were just like, oh, two confused ladies walking through the garden. <laughs> and I don't buy it at all. It's, it reeks of sexism, and it completely ignores the fact that they were very well educated. Although, to be fair, they both claim that they weren't that educated about French history, which comes into it a little later. I'll save my long rant for later. <laughs> but when you look at the pictures of the gardens, it's meant to be seen and enjoyed and traversed. It is not meant to be a maze for two women to get lost in. And and it's not designed like a corn maze, like you can see across it. <laughs> exactly. It's all very well-trimmed gardens. Very clear and beautiful and paved. Agreed. Yeah, that's a great thing to add. Let's dive on in to their experience. So they, like I've said before, they publish a book called An Adventure. And that's what uh, I read to get all of this from. So right from the source, it had a couple different updates. And that's one of the things skeptics are like, well, they changed their story in every update. It's like, well, I don't know how true that is because I only read the final book (laughs) because I wasn't reading three separate books. They may have just had to make it more clear. Yeah. Maybe they were still adding those maps and... They add a whole section in the later versions, like, question, answers to questions we have been asked. Mm. And that is really interesting, so... So let's get into it. Each woman claims to see different ghosts or figures in this event. So I just want to make that clear. The people that they claim to see, like these ghosts, because they call it a haunting. I think that's important, too. They don't necessarily call it time travel. But from our perspective, modern day, it kind of looks like time travel. Yeah. But they thought they were encountering real flesh and blood people. They don't discuss this weird afternoon until a couple months after it, when Charlotte is writing a letter to someone, and she's describing what happened, and she they're hanging out together in their apartment together again. <laughs> and she looks over at Eleanor, and she's like, do you think that Versailles is haunted? And Eleanor goes, yeah. And that's like how they start the conversation, which kind of, that seems really organic, right? Yeah, it doesn't seem like how my experiences have gone in the past, but I do get very cute Sherlock Holmes and Watson vibes. Yes, (laughs) yeah, exactly. And I think it's a common phenomenon in Mm -hmm. experiencers of paranormal activity to ignore the weirdness surrounding an event until later, until you, it's like, it's like trauma, like you're ignoring it until you can process it. And Stella and I have done this ourselves so we've gone big footing something weird happens we know it's weird in the moment but we can't talk about it gotcha so that's i've always been immediately something starts feeling weird and then i start really thinking oh this is really strange i want to get out of here yeah i've you've... never had that kind of mental disconnect where i've seen something so scary or strange that i need a break to figure it out yeah well that's interesting that's good to know well we'll get into their experience and see what comes up because sometimes I start talking and I'm like I have a new idea (laughs) so they are visiting Versailles they Charlotte comes up with this idea to visit uh, historical places in Versailles in chronological order which I think is such a nerd out thing to do they're like let's go sightseeing (laughs) but but let's start at the beginning of French history and work our way forward that's adorable it's so cute right like I feel like I would do that so they go to Versailles they visit the palace and they're actually a little, like, underwhelmed with the inside of the palace. And that's the Grand Petit. No, this is just the, pa- the palace. Oh, okay. The Petit Trianon, where they end up going, and the Grand Trianon are, mm-hmm. like, separate houses in the Garden of Versailles. That's how But they all is. have the same parking lot, to be yes, clear. exactly. It's yeah. very close by. Yeah, it's all close together. But So the palace would have been, historically, like, in Marie Antoinette's time, the time of Louis XVI, would have been where... You know, all of court is staying and living. And Mm -hmm. so the Petit Trianon, where this experience happens, and 
where they're intending to go was given to Marie Antoinette by Louis XVI as a wedding present when they're married. It was built by his father, Mm -hmm. and it's kind of a, they call it a country home. We would not call it a country home, (laughs) but it was, I mean, it was only three floors, and it's very simple compared to the actual palace. So this was kind of a place where Marie, she would go to escape kind of the pressures of, of court life, because being a queen at this time is not... It was a, a big social pressure, you know? Like, yes. Like, there are people watching her get dressed every morning, and, like, she's obligated to invite people to all of, like, all of her meals, and mm-hmm. so this was a place she could get away. She's constantly performative. And yes. this is the one place where she's like, let's go dig some flower beds. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, she doesn't have to perform there. And so she, when she is given this gift, she renovates... The mm-hmm. Petit Trianon. And Petit Trianon means little house in French. So I hope I'm not offending French speakers with my pronunciation, but I'm also not going to call it little house. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so that's where Charlotte and Eleanor are intending to go in the gardens because they both knew of Marie Antoinette, of course, and were kind of interested in her. And it's interesting at this time in England, there does seem to be a little bit of a renaissance about Marie Antoinette's life. Mm hmm. At this time, there was, like, this girl who claimed to be reincarnated Marie Antoinette. And she would, like, go to a museum and look at, like, her little tables and her little apothecary jars and stuff. Yeah. So a lot of skeptics sometimes are like, well, they were just really into Marie. And that's why they think they saw her ghost. So they started from the palace along the main path of the gardens towards the Grand Trianon, which is before you get to the Petite Trianon. They pass the Grand Trianon and continue walking. They kind of recall that maybe they should have made a turn, but they keep going. And Steph did an amazing job. We're going to link all of the maps that she made. She kind of like mapped out exactly where they went because they did that in the book, but it is not easy to follow. We've got the modern benefit of Google Maps Mm -hmm. and satellite view. So So this, when they first pass the Grand Trianon and they think they should have made a turn, is kind of when we start to see a transition. And this is also when their emotional state changes. I'm going to kind of explain. So it might get a little confusing to listen to because they write down their separate experiences and they don't both see the same things. So I'm always going to say who saw what. It might seem tiresome, but I think it's important, you know, to get the entire, like to analyze this. Mm -hmm. So Eleanor sees a few deserted farm buildings and farm tools, including an old-fashioned hand plow. Seemingly at the same time, or very close to it, Charlotte sees the, a woman shaking a white cloth out of the window of a cottage at the corner of a lane that they pass. So she looks to her left, sees this cottage, where a woman is like, you know, shaking a bed sheet or tablecloth or something. And to the right, uh, Eleanor is seeing farm tools and deserted buildings. Charlotte writes that she wondered why Eleanor didn't ask the woman in the house for directions. Um, But she assumed that Eleanor knew the direction. And that's interesting because they both had never been there before. So why is Charlotte assuming that Eleanor knows where she's going? Maybe it's because Eleanor's French is better, you know, and she's just Mm -hmm. relying on her to speak to the people. But it's interesting that, like, they only miss one turn and Charlotte's already like, well, we're lost. I wonder why Eleanor's not asking for directions. And that this is maybe where their true relationship is hidden a little bit. By their narrative. Looking at the map, if they were trying to go directly through the gardens to see the Petite House, (laughs) if they were trying to walk through the gardens and see La Petite Trinon, it's one straight line. And at this point, they've walked past the entrance to the gardens, made a right turn, made a left turn, made a right turn. (laughs) So they're already... Getting pretty far off. Yeah. They're... But she just wants to trust in her friend, girlfriend, whoever. <laughs> so they've seen two groups of people so far. No, they haven't seen anyone yet. The woman in the window? Well, yeah, but they just see her from a distance. They don't meet anyone. Oh, yes. They see the woman in the window and they say, I really wish my friend would ask for directions because <laughs> something doesn't feel right here. Yeah. But they keep going. And Eleanor says that she begins to feel lost and as if something were wrong. 
But they continue along the path and they encounter two men uh, just past another deserted building. And they look in the deserted building and they see this kind of grand staircase. But there's it, it looks deserted, <laughs> so they don't go in. <laughs> Um, and they see these men ahead, and these are the first people that they actually interact with. And they say, you know, they're like, great, now I can ask for directions. So they describe them as gardeners uh, mm-hmm. because they remember them standing near a wheelbarrow and maybe like one of them holding a pointed spade or something in his hand. And despite this evidence of manual labor around them, the men were dressed kind of dignified in, uh, they say, long grayish green coats with small three-cornered hats. It's like a tri colonial hat doesn't sound like the regular laborer of the times maybe well we'll get into that for sure but okay it's not definitely you're right but i also think gardeners might have been dressed fancier in 1901 in versailles like today they're probably wearing khakis yeah they're not digging roads they're out there like weeding yeah, so the rose bushes <laughs> there's a great in their research they find uh like receipts not receipts but records of what the gardeners were doing in Versailles like mm-hmm. on a certain day and in on one day the gardeners were removing caterpillar nests from trees and burning them <laughs> which is completely unnecessary but, <laughs> but I guess the caterpillar nests are ugly the queen is appalled Eleanor asked them for directions and she actually asked them twice because she says she kind of received like a short curt answer and so she asks again and they say the exact same thing mm-hmm. no difference And they are directed forward down the path. So before moving uh, on the path in the way they were directed, Eleanor notices to their right a small but solidly built cottage uh, with stone steps leading up to the door. And a woman and a girl are standing in the doorway. The woman is holding a jug, seemingly passing it to the girl. And they're both wearing white kerchiefs tucked into their dress bodices. And the girl's dress was down to her ankles, which I guess wasn't normal for the times. A young girl would have a shorter dress. Mm -hmm. And she had a small white cap on. She notices that they seem to pause for a moment. Like, as she looks at them, they pause as if, you know, they're in a tableau vivant. A live art reenactment with these people all dressed up and they pose for one split second in the pose. Yeah, exactly. And so... That's a little creepy. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, Eleanor, she's like, yeah, we just quickly moved on and I didn't see them move, but I didn't think about it because, you know, they're just walking along. So I want to add a quick side note about historical dress at the time, because that's really important when you're thinking about how they viewed these other women. Um, in 1901, generally women were still wearing clothes that hadn't changed major like function and form in like 300 years. So women are wearing a bodice or like the fitted top piece of your dress, like a shirt, and a full skirt. Sometimes it's a whole dress, sometimes it's two pieces, Mm -hmm. but generally the same. The size, style, fashion, they all change, but that's kind of the same standard uniform of women. So these wouldn't be totally foreign looking people, they just may look way out of... Out of fashion for the time. Like, you're yeah. wearing, fa- wearing fashion that's three years old. Exactly. You know? It's like, I can tell if someone's trying to, like, it'd be like someone dressing from the 80s. And you're like, well, it doesn't look like you're an alien, but you don't look yeah. thin. <laughs> it's like the difference between bell bottoms and skinny jeans. Like, mm-hmm. same jeans, same fabric, but very different for the times. Yeah, so that kind of explains why Charlotte and Eleanor don't think these people are entirely foreign. They just think they're a little off. And it it would be a lot different if we visited Versailles in 2021 and saw Mm -hmm. women dressed like they did. Like, we would be like, holy crap. That's That's a ghost. That's a ghost (laughs) or like a historical reenactor. Yeah. So at this point, the women both describe gloomy feelings starting to overtake them. Charlotte described an extraordinary depression coming over her that kept deepening. And she begins to take more notice of her surroundings, uh, but keeps her, tries to keep her feelings to herself and trying to conceal her fear. Um, they approach a small wooded area, and suddenly she thinks the environment begins to look unnatural and really unpleasant. She mm-hmm. said the trees are flat and lifeless, and I'll quote here, she said, like a wood worked in tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade, and no wind stirred in the trees. It was all intensely still. So it's almost as if they're viewing the landscape like a painting. It's very strange because they've been walking through trees this entire time. And it's the first time they've ever said, hey, that's really strange when they're actually going way off course in their their walk. This is the first time their environment seems off 
to mm-hmm. them rather than just the people. Uh, Eleanor describes a feeling of depression and loneliness as well. And she, uh, I'll quote her. She says, she began to feel as if I were walking in my sleep. The heavy dreaminess was oppressive. I know that feeling. Yeah, and that's <laughs> not like a light feeling, right? Like you don't just casually think like, oh, suddenly I'm half conscious. I immediately tell somebody, like, yeah, I'm not think feeling you're gonna well. Pass out. Am I about to faint? Is yeah. something wrong? I need to sit down and take a minute and reconnect. Exactly. Uh, like mm-hmm. a normal situation, if you start to feel like you're in a dreamland, you'd be like, we need to sit down and eat some crackers. Yeah. <laughs> and this isn't modern day. This is way back when women still had fainting couches. Mm-hmm. It's not unreasonable for you to be like, oh. I'm overcome. We need a break. I need a moment. Yeah. And they even state in the beginning, they're like, well, it was a brisk day, but we were in the mood for exercise. So clearly they weren't they feeling They wanted a Ill. vigorous walk. Yeah, yeah. They weren't feeling ill or like weak when they first got there. So, so they come upon a wooded area and I'll, so we'll have Steph analyze the map a little later in our conclusions. Um, but she has found probably the wooded area that they walked into and it doesn't make any sense for the record. So, um, <laughs> But the grass kind of gives way, you know, the nice lawn gives way to a patchy forest floor kind of littered with leaves. If you've ever lived in the forest, you know that your yard is never like a green patch of grass. You know exactly what this looks like. It's like here and there and muddy and whatever, (laughs) which is how a forest should be, but I digress. And that's quite inaccurate for how it would have looked in 1901. It would have been a lot more manicured. They see a small building described by Charlotte as a kiosk. Or like a small grandstand, uh, and it almost has like a hexagonal or octagonal shape. Uh, and there was a man sitting in front of it. And they both describe him as sitting on the steps. He's wearing a large slouch hat and a cloak. Charlotte described this as the culmination of my peculiar, sens- peculiar sensations, and I felt a moment of genuine alarm. Eleanor also seems to know this is the accumulation and culmination, damn, <laughs> of something uncanny and fear inspiring so it's interesting that they both in their retelling use the specific word culmination and that's to me that's either like well maybe it was just really intense like Mm -hmm. maybe they're just they really did experience the same thing or they talked a little bit about it and then wrote their experiences which is contrary to what they told us it could also be the language of the times you know you talk to five different people from this time period and they're going to use the same language because it's the most used words. Yeah, and similarly, the educated women as well. Exactly. They're both yeah. in the same social circles, hanging with these prestigious, educated women. Uh-huh. <clears throat> so the man kind of slowly turns to look at them. And they see that his face is marked by smallpox. And he's got smallpox scars on his face, which would have been common even in 1901. Because smallpox wasn't gone until what, like the 60s? <laughs> he doesn't speak to them. This man doesn't speak to them. But they kind of get the feeling that he wasn't really looking at them. But they they can feel his vibes, right? Like they soak up some of his energy. Mm-hmm. And they get this like evil kind of oppressive feeling. And they communicate to each other at the time that they want to go to the right. So that they can get out of the way yeah. of this guy. <laughs> They're basically like, let's go this way. So to recap their emotional state... They're feeling like they're not really connected to the world as they're walking through this forest. The forest doesn't seem right for the time of year. And there is a man dressed in all black sitting on a rock, not quite looking at them, but his (laughs) energy is just scaring them. It's the culmination of their fears and discomforts. Mm -hmm. And it's palpable. Yes. They don't have to communicate with him to feel... Yes. Those bad feelings. And instead of turning around to (laughs) the paved plaza they're walking on, they just say, you know what? Let's just keep going deeper into these woods. Yeah, they're like, we'll avoid him, but we're not going to turn around. (laughs) (laughs) Which, you know, maybe they just were tough. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe they're disoriented in some mental way, which I kind of believe. So suddenly both of the women, they're, you know, they're going towards the right. They're walking. And they hear someone running up behind them, which they almost think is a relief because they're not alone anymore, right? With this creepy guy. Yeah. Even though that would have freaked me out more. Like, I just saw this creepy guy (laughs) and now maybe he's running towards me. Yeah, they don't look around and see before they're like, oh, 
right? So they both hear someone running up behind them, uh, but they never see anyone running. Suddenly there's just another guy there. And Charlotte describes him as having come from the direction of some large boulders on the path to their left. He kind of was shocked. Like, he he himself looks like he's shocked to see them. Yeah. And the man, he you know, he's all red-faced from running, but he's distinctly a gentleman. That's a quote from the book. <laughs> did he uh, bow or something? What's that? Did he bow? How do they know? Where... I think his dress, you know, and maybe just his good looks. Because, mm. I don't know. Maybe the, the, there's like a class thing going on here for sure. Yeah. Right? But they call they describe him as tall with large dark eyes and curly black hair. It's kind of good looking. <laughs> uh, and they say he was wearing a large sombrero hat, kind of like the slouch hat of the scary pockmarked man before him. Uh, and he, Eleanor says he has buckled shoes. That's all she remembers from him. So he's red faced from running and probably from the heat, you know, of that cloak he's wearing in the middle of summertime. <laughs> and he seems excited. And he calls out to them. He's like, Madame, Madame. Uh, and he speaks really quickly, and in French, of course, telling them to go to the right towards the house. And they both say that he said more to them, but that he was speaking so fast they couldn't pick it mm, up. Mysterious. Yeah, like, what else was he saying? And although they're kind of surprised to even have been, like, caught up with and directed by someone, they they keep going. They're like, that's weird, but that's the way we were going, so yeah. cool. And they later say in their research that, you know, it's actually, they had heard from other peers at the time that it's really hard to find a guide in the gardens, especially on this little wooded path, not on the main uh, throughway. So it is odd that someone came up to them. They keep going. They're like, cool. And so as they turn away, they hear the trotting, of, like they hear him running away. But it, it, like, stopped really abruptly. Like, it's not mm-hmm. like they're hearing it in real time. I kind of imagined it as, like, they're hearing someone, a recording of someone running, and suddenly you just hit stop. Ooh. You know, and it ends. So they think that's really weird because it wasn't, like, it didn't seem like just a normal person running up to them. So they continue, and they cross a small bridge, and the bridge passes over a tiny ravine that kind of culminates in a pool of water below and to the right of them. To the left is a stream of water that falls down this beautiful green bank. Luscious ferns are growing from in between the stones, and it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, uh, they come to a prairie, which is kind of bordered by trees, and it's directly in front of the petite Trianon. Charlotte, although it sounds beautiful to us, she describes this as kind of a dark and somber view. And she sees a woman. So as they approach the house. Uh, she's seated on the sub by the side of the house, and she looks like she's sketching the trees that are in front of her in the prairie. Mm-hmm. Um, she's sitting on like a little camp stool, and they both pass by this woman. Uh, as they both pass by the woman, the woman directly turns and looks at Charlotte. Mm-hmm. She describes her as uh, not young, though rather pretty. <laughs> so not a you know beautiful, striking young woman, but still beautiful or still attractive. Uh, And she wore a shady white hat and a light handkerchief over her low-cut bodice. The dress was long-waisted with a very full short skirt. So this is kind of, again, like, it's not unheard of for someone to dress like that, but it's not in fashion at all. She came so close to the woman uh, that she noticed the handkerchief around her shoulders was embroidered with either green or gold. And that's, like, really, you have to get really close to someone. And when you look at the map where she was sitting, like, they walked right by her. Like, they could have reached out and touched her, probably. So the layout of the house, they're coming up to the back door, which is facing to the north. They're walking up these steps, they make a right turn and walk up to a veranda, and the woman is supposed to be sitting along those steps, essentially. Uh So they have to walk directly past her to get up to the next level of the veranda. Yeah, they make a turn, basically, right after they pass her onto the terrace thing. And Charlotte remembers that she thought she was a tourist, but that her clothes were kind of old-fashioned and and unusual. And she surprisingly feels really annoyed that the woman is there. Like, she looks at her and she gets this feeling of like, ugh. So that's kind of interesting. How strange. We'll talk about that later. How strange. Yeah, it's really interesting. I have a theory about that. Eleanor, this is all Charlotte's encounter. So Eleanor does not remember seeing this woman at all. Although she does remember when they're walking on that path, she remembers moving her skirt to the side to make room for someone. 
although there was no one there. And she wondered in the moment why she felt compelled to move her skirt. That is one of the things that stands out to me as very strange. They're walking with full skirts this entire time and they're suddenly like, oh, I better make way during the bottleneck leading Mm -hmm. up to this porch, basically. And there's no one there. She, like, never, and she never even comes back, like, it'd be different, and she was like, well, I guess there were people there, but she, she's like, yeah, I never saw anything, but I did move my skirt. Like, it's weird. This would be much less compelling to me if it was full of tourists. Exactly. But they see very few people, and every time it's a strange experience. Yeah. This, of course, is the woman that Charlotte claimed was the last queen of France, Marie Antoinette. And in later years, as the women research the history of the queen and the French Revolution, they're trying to figure it all out, Charlotte stumbles upon a portrait of Antoinette and her children by an artist called Wirt Müller. That's the German pronunciation, I think. I hope I'm not messing that up. But in the book she writes, she includes a passage that accompanies the portrait. Um, it's in French, and I had to translate it. and says... Quote, this picture was badly received by contemporary critics who found it cold, unmanageable, and ungainly. For posterity, on the contrary, it has the greatest merit, that of resemblance. According to Madame Campin, there is no good portrait of the queen except this canvas by Wertmuller and the one Madame, Madame Lebrun painted in 1787. So this, she finds this portrait and she's like, that's the woman I saw. That's the freaking woman I saw. And then she does research and she finds out that critics think that's the only good example of what Marie actually looked like in real life. And that, like, blows her mind. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this is during the time period where you take these very ugly royal people and you paint the most flattering picture you can of them Mm -hmm. for the sake of their vanity, I would assume. Yeah, and you know, Marie Antoinette, actually, I was reading, when I was reading about the Petite Trianon, like on the Versailles website, she was not well received, like some of her portraits were not well received by court. She does this portrait um, of her in like this beautiful gauze, kind of casual dress with like a garden hat on. Mm-hmm. And it's, people hate it so much in court that she had it repainted over with like a fancier dress on. Yeah. So, it's really clear, like, people really were critiquing her paintings. This isn't, like, a one-off, you know, analysis. It seems like there was a lot of research about her in this way. So they're almost through their experience. We're going to get to the end of it real soon. So they pass this woman uh, on the left, and they climb up the steps to the terrace. And they kind of begin to wander. So they're kind of on the porch, you know, of the Petite Trianon. They begin to wander towards an unshuttered window. And soon a boy comes out of the door from an adjacent building, which later we know is the chapel. It's probably 50, maybe more feet away. They can see him in the distance, but he is not popping up suddenly next to them. They see him walking up to them. Yes, yeah, and that's kind of different than how they viewed the the running guy. Yeah. So uh, they both note that a large door kind of slams behind him when he comes out, and He greets them and he directs them to enter the house through a different entrance because there were entrances on all four sides of the petite train up. And he kind of smiles at them and they they described it as almost like he's suppressing his mockery, like he's really judging them. (laughs) And he's a little amused that he has to like, you know, reroute them. So he takes them around the buildings and uh, guides them to an entrance like right where, right next to where they had just come from. And Charlotte wonders why, you know, they went on this huge roundabout route when they could have just been turned around. Like, he could have yeah. been like, turn around and go back. But um, but that's interesting. And Eleanor doesn't question it at all. She's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, she describes this feeling. At this time, she gets another feeling of, like, jeeriness and weirdness until they enter the actual building. And so when we look at the map, we know it really was a weird roundabout route. It's very strange... And if what they described is true, that route did not exist at the time at the time that they walked. There was remodeling done. They changed the paths. It's suspicious. It is. It's really spooky. So this is kind of where their weird journey ends. They go yeah. into the the house where there is actually a wedding happening, and so they kind of kind of just watch this wedding party exit and you know enjoy. 
And they take a carriage back to the palace, and they mm-hmm. have tea at the cafe there, and they go home. And they don't really talk about it. They're just like, oh, well, we got lost in the gardens, and, and it's not a spooky thing. So, like I said, it's only till later when they're talking that they realize something weird has happened. So we're going to kind of dive into the research that uh, Charlotte and Eleanor did themselves about their event. To kind of recap, you know, they have this crazy, haunting-type, spooky experience at Versailles, and they they don't really acknowledge it until a couple months later, and that's when they are intrigued because, um, I don't know if I even mentioned this, Charlotte is talking about the woman she saw, who she later came to believe was Marie, and Eleanor is like, there was no woman. What are mm. you talking about? And that, like, freaks them out a lot, and so that's the beginning of their research. And the book... An Adventure comes out in 1911, the first edition, so they spent 10 years researching this. And this is, of course, pre-internet, pre-really any kind of research system we have today. So all of their research is from real libraries in France and England, actual people they talk to in the gardens, like guides and things like that. So one of the things that skeptics really kind of poke at is the credibility of their research and we've we talked about this a lot too because there's zero way for us to vet those sources we took their word for it for the sake of the story but you should know that their research is not peer-reviewed not, <laughs> exactly not peer-reviewed i wanted to mention too this is kind of a big part of the story but it really muddles muddles <laughs> muddies the waters a lot um So this happened in August, is when they visit the gardens, August 9th. And Eleanor goes back to Versailles uh, January 1st of the next year and tries to kind of retrace their steps. And she has a really interesting time. Uh, I really recommend reading the book. It's free on Google Books. She basically doesn't even try to retrace her steps. She goes there with that intention and then she just ends up going a different way. And she doesn't really explain her thought process. But even though she's in a different place of the gardens, she still has some ghostly, more typical ghost-type experiences. She claims that she hears the rustling of, like, big crinoline dresses kind of all around her on one of the trails. Like, she's being surrounded by people she can't see. She hears, like, this orchestra music that she later can recall and write down, and it's supposed to have been a symphony from Marie Antoinette's time. And she also sees a messenger, a lot like the one they saw on their first trip, kind of like darting in the woods, like kind of spooky this time. So I, when I read about her second experience in the gardens, I don't find it credible that she didn't try to retrace her steps. She didn't mention it. She doesn't, it just doesn't, I don't understand what the point was Yeah. of including any of that other than maybe to add the weird stuff that happened. And so that happened and it, it really makes the story a little more confusing. So that's why I didn't focus on it in depth because I think it only, it only just makes for more things to have to explain away. I think Eleanor is kind of the problematic one in this story. If it's her delusion, and there's nobody there that's grounding her in reality, she could just be amping herself way up and saying, those leaves sound like the rustling of dresses, and I definitely know that it's Marie Antoinette. And at this point, when she goes in January, they've already discussed their theories. Mm -hmm. She's alone, so there's no one there vetting her. So... Let's put that aside and let's get into their research. So every interesting encounter that the women experienced, uh, they followed up with years of research. They attempted to verify every detail of the clothing, language, and the situation of the people and landmarks they encountered. Most of these to me seemed to check out, but you have to take, you know, the credibility of their research into account. And to be fair, I have some confirmation bias because I want to believe that this is a cool time. I don't think that these women were 
Um, I'm not a skeptical person if you haven't figured that out yet. So I believe that they, they put themselves in the garden in the year 1789. But many skeptics, you know, dispute their claims and call their resources unreliable. I don't have the energy to double check that research, like I said, and it's not realistic at all for me to do that, especially because I am in the United States and a lot <laughs> of their sources are probably in libraries in France. So I'm going to go through each one of the apparitions or weird stuff that doesn't make sense <laughs> that they saw and I'm going to give you their kind of a summarized version of their explanation and the research they did. You ready? Keep your skeptical hat on because somebody who experienced something went back to all their own research. And they wanted to believe. Yeah. You know, they very much, it's like I, like we said at the very beginning, they were not ashamed of this experience. Yeah. They told everyone. Oh, something cool I wanted to mention. Eleanor mentions that right after they had kind of talked to each other and realized they went through something weird, she's talking to an acquaintance in Paris, and her that person tells her that there's a rumor that the gardens of Versailles are haunted by Marie Antoinette. So this was like already almost a trope. And that might have yeah. been, who knows, maybe that's a fib from years later. I wanted to point out, uh, we're going to add the map that Steph made to our website and to, I'm going to put it in the show notes. And they're all, Steph like did an amazing job and labeled where all these yeah. things might so have been. So it's labeled in order of the appearances and it's labeled E as in Eleanor, B as in both, or C as in Charlotte. Yeah, it really helps you visualize kind of the scale of what was going on. Yes. So first is the plow and farm buildings that Eleanor saw that were out of place right after they believe they've made their first wrong turn. And they dated this plow to, uh, from pictures of similar models as one kept at the Petit Trianon by Louis XVI, which was Marie Antoinette's husband. And he kept it as an antique there. It wasn't in use. And they learned this from one of the guides at Versailles. So it's a first-hand source. And in 1901, no plows were kept at Versailles. So that's pretty interesting. They place it directly to the time they want to believe they're in. It's a pretty boring one. <laughs> it's pretty boring, but that's kind of the goodness of it. Yeah, it's almost more credible because it's not exciting. Exactly. Like, who imagines, oh, I can't wait to see that plow. Yeah, like, I saw a 1789 hand plow at Versailles. It was so spooky. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so next is the woman shaking a white cloth out of the window, uh, and that's what Charlotte sees at about the same time Eleanor is seeing the plow. There is zero explanation for this. They find a map that maybe suggests there could have been a cottage there at one point, but there's no way to verify it, and they have no idea, of course, who the woman is, mm -hmm. or, and they can't, you know, she's just doing chores. So now we get into the people. So they come upon the gardeners who are dressed in green tricorn, green and tricorn hats. Uh, they ask them for directions, and this is when their emotional state starts to change. They did a lot of research about yeah. the uniforms of these men. At this time, green is the color worn uh, by the royal livery, only colors that the royal servants can wear. So only people in employ of the crown the Would royal gardeners, the royal servants, stable masters, whatever word you want to use for that. Yeah, exactly. So um, that is, you know, kind of ties it in. Um, green uniforms were not utilized in 1901 in Versailles. So there are no people employed in Versailles in 1901 wearing green. So it's kind of out the window that those were regular gardeners. The gardeners at the time were wearing black coats and white pants. That was their summer uniform. Both the women theorized that these two men might have been guards that were kind of just on duty when the queen was at the Petit Trianon. And we talked about that a little bit. It's weird that they don't see any people this whole time, like other tourists, um, because it was summer at Versailles and it was really popular. But if they were somehow in 1789, when Marie Antoinette lived there, uh, there definitely would have been guards there. Of course, they never... It should have pointed this out, but I think it's obvious. They don't disprove themselves on any of these things. Mm -hmm. Next, they pass the kind of tableau vivant of the woman and girl with the jug. 
And that's what Eleanor sees. There's a lot to be said about this. So that building, uh, they, when they went back and explored in 1901 and the, the later years, it didn't exist. In a map of the garden from 1783, a, a building, building is in the correct place to have been what they saw. And that, but that's if they are placing their route in the right place, of course. Like, and that's all, it's exactly what we did. It's all guesswork. And they claim to have gone back later using that map and have seen evidence of a building foundation and like a garden wall where it would have been. That seems a little not super credible to me. I don't know. Yeah. These women aren't masons. And like if you, if I went somewhere and was trying to place an old building on a map, like what's evidence of a foundation? Is it an actual foundation or is it like a trench? <laughs> the tricky part is... The 1783 is the most circulated map. It's the original planning for the building. Mm. There aren't, I couldn't find any maps from the 1901 era in which they would have visited, which it seems like it was kind of decrepit Mm -hmm. because there was a rebuilding of the site. And now if you look on Google Maps, it looks almost exactly like the 1783 map, Mm -hmm. except it's a bit more civilized there's less open green areas yeah yeah they have restored a lot of the petite train on to how it was Mm -hmm. when marie lived there and that's a big part of their history now so so we can't look back and say for sure this is what they saw because they could have just been looking at the same map i have now and said oh well it seems like there was a cottage here exactly and i I'm not a map salesman. <laughs> like, I don't really have the knowledge to, to judge that. But this is another interesting part of this story. So a popular book at the time was called Legends of Trianon. You know, in this vernacular, legends is kind of like folk tales. Um, so it's not necessarily crazy things. There's a story told by an eyewitness that on October 5th of 1789... The queen was walking with a young girl named Marion, who was the daughter of a gardener in Versailles. This, the, Marion left the queen, who wanted to be alone in her grotto, and soon after, a messenger came to the queen, uh, who is suspiciously similar to the man they saw running, uh, Charlotte and Eleanor saw running in the garden. He warns her of the mob approaching the palace from Paris. This is the day that Marie and... The king and their two children are held hostage and they have to listen to their Swiss guards being murdered and essentially overthrown. That was the day the the monarchy was essentially destroyed. So the person, the eyewitness who tells this is supposedly Marion herself. Like she tells this story in this book um, that she was there and she was with the queen just before she received this horrible news. And she says the messenger instructed the queen to go to the house and wait for a carriage to take her back to the palace rather than following her own tuition, the queen's, which was to walk back to the palace. So I think this is interesting because they are trying so, so hard to place this young woman, Marion, in the story. And they didn't even see this woman's face. Like, she saw the woman and the girl with the jug from a distance, and she's suddenly like, oh, what if it was the daughter of the undergardener from this one book and in the legend? And yeah, the story, I I totally believe the story about the messenger coming to tell her, because that's documented elsewhere, but this just seems crazy. (laughs) I don't know. I'm trying to think of something that you could compare this to. It's just... This is a little bit, to me, like they're trying to make their story even more credible by relating it to a woman who we, we know existed. Because we do know Marion really existed. And they find her in other research. It just feels to me like they're trying so hard to relate themselves into this story of a famous tragic moment. So that's all I have to say about that. The kiosk and the scary man. They identify this man as... His name is long and hard. Hold on. The Comte de Vaudreau. He is a member of the court at the time. And he's also an amateur actor. And he convinces the queen in 1783 to allow the public performance of the marriage of Figaro. 
And uh, that's because his friend wrote the play. <laughs> so he himself played the part of one of the main characters. So like kind of a selfish decision. And it's blatant satire against the monarchy. This is all from Wikipedia. It didn't look good. It kind of created created a situation where it's okay now to talk about the fall of the royalty. I'm probably dramatizing that, but but this weakened Marie's Antoinette's position kind of in her society. And she started avoiding this man about two years later. So that's who they claim this man is. Um, he was known to have the same complexion. And he also had smallpox. Other than that, that's all they have. That's all they got. <laughs> Sounds like, pretty weak. Yeah, they're like, could be this guy she had a bad relationship with, but she stopped talking to four years. Like, if they think they're in 1789, she hadn't talked to him in four years. But, you know, maybe as she's sitting in the hall waiting for her death, she's thinking about what led to this event. You know, and maybe it was... This, this horrible guy who she thought was her friend, but used her for his selfish ends and led to this. I don't know. It's That's all based on the theory that this is them reliving Marie Antoinette's last thoughts and movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Besides the man, the kiosk is not located in the gardens in 1901. And this is kind of another one of those situations where they're like, well, we found a map. That has a building that's kind of like this, maybe in this spot. But because the gardens are changed, re-landscaped or whatever, who knows? Might have been there, might not. So that's the scary guy. And I, I just don't think that their explanation of this guy explains the creepiness of him. Yeah. Right? I don't think somebody giving you bad advice and you not talking to them two years later... It's enough of a feeling to give you this kind of a dreadful a culmination of my fears. And why would he be sitting there? Yeah. Like, if he is a comte, like, I don't know where that is in the hierarchy of French royalty, but he's not the guy taking pan at the toll booth. You know? Like, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make sense to me. He's there to scare weary travelers back to town. <laughs> <laughs> So that's their explanation. You know, it's funny because I really want to believe them. But as we go through these, I'm just ripping them apart. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to believe. Like when I was writing the script, I was like, oh, they totally time traveled. This is totally real. As I'm saying it out loud, I'm like, wow, this is not credible. <laughs> and the thing is, nobody is disproving them in their own book. They wrote it all themselves, yes. and if the best they can come up with to prove that this is the man is that he looks kind of similar, they can't place him there on any kind of date. They're like finding one guy that she had a tiff with. All of the of people, people she knew. Yeah, yeah, like there's probably a lot of people she had bad experiences with. I don't know. So next is the running man. He comes up after they pass the scary pockmarked guy. And they identify this guy as the messenger to the queen from that book, The Legends of Trianon, which also, you know, there are, of course, records of this experience happening. You know, that book isn't the only way we know that man existed or that this happened. And he's the one who told the queen of the incoming mob from Paris uh, and led her to safety. The boulders that he magically appeared behind or in front of are not located in the park in 1901 they do you know try to find some landscaping notes from marie's time and they think there probably were boulders in this part of the park but they you know it's just the same thing again like they can't directly place it and i should point out like this isn't all these things that they can't exactly place i don't necessarily think that's their fault like i don't think they're making it up i think they're going on the reasonable assumption that record keeping at that time of all of the exact boulders and trees and tiny little buildings wasn't super accurate yeah you know the queen at this time is like ripping out walls and staircases of petite trianon like she's renovating the entire house and gardens and it, it makes sense that things might have slipped through the cracks or that the records aren't available anymore yeah so that's something to know, too. I don't mean to completely be like, but they couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's a lot harder to misplace several cottages mm -hmm. than to lose track of a boulder. 
Yeah, for in sure. In the woods. <laughs> so you think it's more credible that the boulders could have been there in 17? The boulders don't prove anything <laughs> to me. You think this point's dumb, that, like the boulders don't matter. It's a rock. There's lots of rocks in the woods. <laughs> You could have been anywhere. And that's <laughs> that's the thing, too. If there are other rock-type land formations, they definitely could be mistaken this for something else in the park. But they try. They really try their hardest. Yeah. They do some great detective work, but they can't explain everything. I pointed this out when we were discussing it, but they also say that it's really... A lot of people, their peers say, it's really hard to find a guide in the park. Like, you'll be looking for someone because you'll be lost, or you'll be looking for someone for information. And it's really hard to find them. So it's a little uncanny that one of them like ran up to them and gave them directions yeah. without asking. The more I'm hearing it, the less I'm believing it. I know. And I really wanted to believe. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see where we end up. But. So next they go through the like a wooded area uh, and over a small rustic bridge. They are, of course, unable to find any of this when they return back to the park in later years. There is no tiny bridge. There is no cascade. There is no, like, beautiful little fern. They do think that on maps of the park from the renovation in 1783, is it right to call it a park? I feel like I sound super uneducated. (laughs) The gardens. Gardens. You know, they are in a woods that would have been there at the same time, probably. So it's not unheard of that there might be a water structure that isn't there anymore. Yeah. But they just, you know, they it's just one of those things they point to where they're like, well, this doesn't exist anymore, so where were we? And it's... <laughs> Steph just rolled her eyes so hard. <laughs> it's interesting because it's it could be, you know, it definitely could be. Maybe Maybe it's true. Maybe they were in a different time or place or state of mind or reality but maybe they were just lost yeah i'm having a hard time with all of this because when you look at their map they don't have any points of reference the map doesn't accurately portray their trip through the woods at all Mm -hmm. it seems like they just skirt the cottages but then you compare that to google maps the 1700s map and it's not adding up so then we kind of come to the big kahuna. This is when they come out of the woods and they're walking towards the petite tree and on and they see who Charlotte believes to be Marie Antoinette. And she uh, verifies this claim by uh, researching the clothes she was wearing. And <laughs> this is another weird like thing that changes in their story because at one point in the very beginning of the book when she's first telling her story, She describes her clothing really well. And it is clothing from that era. That's on point. But later, when she's saying that she saw the portrait of the woman who looked just like her, she says that the clothes are the same. And in that portrait, Marie is wearing like an evening gown, like a silver evening gown covered in bows and like a really fancy hat. She's not wearing the straw hat or the kind of flowy, gauzy dress that she was describing in her description. And so I don't, that was that just like a miss later, like something she like miss said? She miss say it? Are we talking about the same painting? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe she's just mixing up her research, but. That seems like a pretty big error when you've worked for 10 years on a book. Exactly, exactly. And she even goes into like the queen's records of her clothing. And she talks about how the queen was cutting back on her wardrobe at the time. It's right before everything blows up. Yeah. She says in her results that she had a light colored skirt, a white fichu, which is essentially like a big kerchief that goes over your shoulders, and a straw hat. And she says, in 1902, I saw Vert Mueller's picture of the queen, which alone of all the many portraits shown me in any way brought back the face I had seen. I hate the writing style of this era, by the way. The picture reminded me of the queen. <laughs> of all the other ones she had seen. Right? Like, it's such a weird way to talk. In one of the journals of one of the queen's dressers or like mm-hmm. like a lady-in-waiting type people, they talk about how economical she was that year with her clothing, the queen. 
And they, she writes down uh, several pieces of clothing she repaired for the queen. They included short skirts, two green silk bodices, and many large white feet shoes. So that's exactly the kind of clothes she was seen in when they saw her in 1901. I mean, that checks out. The clothing is right. But it's just, it's not a lot. That's really all they have on her is identifying the clothes and her face from that one portrait. And granted, I do think that that means a lot. I'm not trying to downplay this at all. I think if any of their experiences that day were real, this one might have been real. Because... I think it's more plausible to say that they saw one individual ghost of the queen, you know, who at her private country home where she tried to escape and be the happiest rather than this entire scenario, you know, it's just this one part, if it is real, seems the most plausible to me. It has some credence to me because Charlotte is the only one who sees the queen drawing Uh and Eleanor just feels something, moves her petticoats. I do think that portrait is... Yeah. It is an accurate representation of her. It wasn't a popular portrait because of that, Mm -hmm. but that's what she saw. So I do think of all of the experiences, this is the most credible one. And I also think it's the most romantic because they knew of Marie Antoinette. They're going to her summer home. They... They're interested in her history. So it makes sense to think that if they're priming or manifesting something or priming themselves to see a ghost, that her ghost would be the one they would see. Yeah. So last is the uh, the young man who redirected them around the terrace. So the door that this guy came out of, that they both remember, you know, it slammed really hard. It's not used in Versailles in 1901. And in fact, the entire terrace is arranged differently because of renovations to the buildings around the outside. When they went back to Versailles to research, they saw the same door. You can't even get to it anymore because they ripped down a stairway. The door is on a second level of a church. Mm -hmm. And it directly overlooks the terrace because the terrace is elevated. So for the boy, during the supposed 1901 construction Mm -hmm. the boy wouldn't have been able to walk straight towards them and be in their line of sight the entire time he would have had to go through a different door go downstairs come up a different set of stairs and walk around a building yeah and so this is another part that i think is really credible because this it seems credible to me the buildings are just physically different and you can't rearrange the structures around the Petit Trianon. I think what makes this credible is there's a landmark. They know exactly where they are. Yes. There's no saying that they're lost in the woods. There's a second part to this where the women say they're walking down a wide tree-lined carriage road to go around to the front of the building the boy is directing them to. And they cut between two separate kitchen buildings. Mm -hmm. In 1901, those two buildings were made into one. So there's no road that they could have walked on. And there is sign that that road used to be there. Yeah, you can see in the wall of the kitchen, like where the new and old construction is. And they still have pavement markers in the floor of the building, basically. Yeah, they talk to a guide in the chapel at Versailles and the guide giggles at them. Yeah. When they're like, have you ever used that door? And he's like, I've been here 20 years and I've never even seen that door open. Yeah. Why would you have a door that opens out into like a 10 foot drop working? (laughs) It's like the Winchester mystery house. (laughs) You just want to kill people. They kind of claim they think that this boy was probably, you know, a servant or some kind or maybe a clergyman who, you know, he's on that second floor, which is where the quarters of the queen's servants would have been. And that he would have been able to see them coming Mm -hmm. out of a window. And so he came out to redirect them basically around the queen. Yeah. Because remember we said they could have just turned around and gone back uh, the short way to the other entrance to the house. But he takes them all the way around the outbuildings. It's like saying go to the servant's entrance. He's like, go all the way around, you dumb British people. (laughs) (laughs) So if the gardens are open to guests at this point. 
it just makes total sense. Like the queen doesn't acknowledge them, but she stares at them because she's like, yeah. why are you walking so close to me? And then her henchman is like, okay, you need to go this way because the queen is over there trying to relax and you're traipsing around yeah. her house, essentially. Can I go into my map? Yes, let's analyze the map of their route. So this is based off their direct statements <laughs> from both of them from the 1800s map. I could not find a 1900s map. And I backed it up with Google Maps so that I could give you an accurate estimation of the distance they walked. So it starts out on the left side of the map that you're looking at, if you're looking at it. You follow the line, they go to the first stop, 1E, which is where one of the girls sees an old farm plow. Then to their right, they see the woman shaking the cloth outside of the cottage window. The other girl sees that. And then stop three is where they see the gardeners in the field and they get directions from these men. The men say, continue walking straight ahead. If they walked in that direction, they would just end up walking through a very large garden to a building that isn't there anymore <laughs> and into the woods eventually. So they don't listen to him, and then they see the beautiful passing of the jug at four. <laughs> so Eleanor looks to her left, sees... The plow. The plow. Charlotte looks to the right. She sees cloth shaking out the mm -hmm. window lady. So what I'm trying to say is Eleanor is seeing different things on both sides of the path. So it's not like they have tunnel vision. I'm trying to rule out the fact that she's just like maybe repeating herself. If this is a reenactment or like theater people, there are a lot of them and they're doing a lot of weird, yeah, varied tasks. Menial stuff and it's not even handing a water jug isn't an interesting reenactment. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I would not pay <laughs> to see that shit. Spot on. So they see the woman handing off the jug to the young girl and they walk straight decide to make a right turn against the direction that the gardeners gave them. And from there on out, they don't explain the directions they're taking. So they make the right towards the forest, and there's three paths in front of them, if you would believe this map. A path to the left, to the gazebo, a path going straight, kind of skirting the wood line, and if you stick to the right, you stay in the pretty paved <laughs> gardens. It doesn't make any sense to me that they both unanimously decide, without talking, to go furthest away from their destination. This speaks to their altered state of mind. Exactly. This uh, is when they enter the woods and they feel like it's not a real woods. Essentially, the path they take is the most circuitous yeah. route they could possibly take without walking into a lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're skirting this lake. It makes no sense. Even if they're lost, you would stick with the buildings. You wouldn't just wander into the woods. Mm -hmm. So maybe they are truly lost. And the reason yes. they don't say in their explanations of like why they went the way they did is because they don't know why and they don't yeah. know where they even went. Or, you know, maybe they were under some false sense of direction. Yeah. Maybe something, some greater power or something else is leading them a certain way. Yeah. Just a thought. So... They're following the far left path through the forest. They see the scary man and immediately say, no, I'm not going to go down that road. That makes sense. That's the only thing that makes sense to me. So they make a hard right turn. And then a man comes running up behind them at spot number six and <laughs> says, no, you need to keep going around this little pond right here. Okay, cool. That's fine. <laughs> So they cross the bridge that they supposedly couldn't find, and they just keep walking and walking through this wilderness to a prairie, and they finally see the building. What I think is interesting, they come out of the woods and they walk through the prairie. On the map, the prairie is huge. It's huge. It's absolutely huge compared to the spaces they were walking through before. I Maybe it's just the way they tell the story, but it's almost like they compressed their memory of walking through this. They make it seem like they immediately walked up on this woman sketching. Yeah, they skipped a lot of ground that they covered and other paths that they came across. They walked past a big fountain that they didn't mention at all. Maybe they are just in another altered state of mind. I think, yeah. isn't this where at a certain point it got kind of dreamy? I think that's where they thought it got dark 
when they yeah. first came out of the woods. Oh, yeah, she says it's dark and gloomy. Yeah, and in Which my is... mind, I'm like, was there a sudden storm that rolled in? Yeah. Or... Well, they say in the beginning of their trip that it was like a bright, sunny day with a breeze. Yeah. And you're walking out of the dark woods into the sunshine, mm -hmm. and you feel more gloomy. It doesn't make sense. So they walk up to the house, which would be the back entrance. They walk up the terrace at spot number eight. They see Marie Antoinette, supposedly, walk past her up these stairs and onto a big terrace. The doors, the red line here is where the chapel boy would have ran up. Mm -hmm. Those doors hadn't been opened since royalty lived there because they're considered like the grand court doors. Mm -hmm. they're very fancy. So they get picked up by the altar boy who walks them. <laughs> I love that description. <laughs> we keep giving him more, like, less dignified titles. We're like, young man, boy, altar boy. <laughs> <laughs> young man comes sprinting out of a church and directs them down a carriage path, which is about 12 feet wide, they said. That path doesn't exist on the maps mm -hmm. nowadays. Or in the 1900s timeline. So it says that they cut through the split kitchen, which would be the first turn. But honestly, I can't, I can't suss out one way or the other how far they walked around this loop. It's hard to tell because in this map, there's a couple different little alleyways out to that carriage path they yeah. said they left on. Either way... It it's doesn't a make very sense. long distance. Yeah, either way, it's a really long way to walk when they legit could have just spun around and walked yeah. a fifth of the distance. So then they walk down another street all the way around through the courtyard to the house, which has a wedding going on inside of it. Mm -hmm. So all this time they walked up to a house. They didn't see anything. They didn't hear anything. They're standing on the front porch and they don't notice anything. And if you look on Google... It is a big, huge windowed house. Yeah. It is not a private place. And they walk around three sides of the thing before they realize there's a wedding inside. <laughs> I also think it's really weird that, I mean, it's August. It's hot. Yeah. And I don't think that they would have a wedding in a building with no AC with closed windows. Yeah. It makes sense to me that there might be some open windows and therefore some noise. You know, even if you didn't see what might be a wedding party inside the from the windows, which are huge, and yeah. Marie Antoinette did that herself. She replaced the windows and made them even bigger. You would hear, you know, music or chatter. And, and maybe they're not describing the wedding party well enough. Yeah, it's very suspicious to me, <laughs> like, that they were completely lucid and they didn't notice any of this. They walked, I approximate, because you can only do so much with Google Maps. Mm -hmm. to estimate the distance but a lot of the structures are still there so i believe i am accurate within like two tenths of a mile if they went the crazy roundabout way they said they did they walked at least 1.2 miles it's not a short walk when you can see your destination from where you start out it's definitely not a short walk in a couple layers of heavy skirts in august in august with On a no hot, sunny day no water bottle they told us exactly where they started out and they walked down this one shady, nice wide lane mm -hmm. directly past the entrance to the gardens, past all the side entrances to the gardens, and they somehow didn't see the giant three-story house over some hedges. Mm -hmm. So if you had walked from where they started through the gardens to the house through the main door like everybody else, it would have been 0.2 miles. So they walked five times as far as they should have, at least, and didn't question it in any kind of meaningful way. Just went on a jaunt through the woods. And if they had a guidebook and they're walking all this distance, they never once thought, this seems like we're kind of far out there. I'm not sure about this, Eleanor. <laughs> it's true. I just... They never even mention yeah. referencing their book. At the very beginning, they're like, well, we have Bedecker's map, but there's never like, well, we felt lost, so we stopped and we opened up our book. And that's like, these are smart women with like capabilities. Yeah. <laughs> so you think the first thought would be to use their resources and they don't. Yeah. That's interesting. And they didn't ask anybody for directions except the guys who gave them 
bad directions, which they promptly ignored. Yeah, and I don't... It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I don't... I don't get it. Do you want to start moving into theories? At the end of the book, she gives their conclusion. And it's beautiful. I have to say, the end is a beautiful Mm -hmm. writing piece. A nice writing exercise. Exactly. So they conclude that they stumbled into a physical memory of Marie Antoinette. And that as she sat in the palace, listening to the death of her Swiss guards that day, on October 5th, 1789, she was sending herself to a mental place. She's meditating sending herself to a happier place, you know, the days when she would spend her time at the Petit Trianon sketching and... And watching the girl with the water jug. Exactly, like, oh, simpler times. (laughs) They claim that all these things and people that they interacted with are parts of her memory that that they were living. And this kind of accounts for the the painting-like, the tapestry-like setting and their weird feelings, uh, the dreamlike feeling of the experience. So that's their explanation. And it's really flowery and beautiful. And honestly, I kind of love it. And it's interesting, too, because they call this a haunting. You know, in our time in 2022, God, 2022, we don't view a haunting and a physical memory as the same thing. Yeah. But to them, that was really similar. So... That's just kind of my thoughts on their conclusions. Let's talk about some of these skeptic explanations before we go into our own personal theories. Skeptic theories and why they're dumb. (laughs) That's what I put on my outline. (laughs) Well, because when you're researching this, you know, I kind of thought a lot of the skeptic theories were based in sexism. And I still think that because generally a lot of the people who came out and were like, these women didn't know what they were talking about. They were sexist in the way they did it. Yeah. There is a specific woman, uh, what's her last name, In- Ingamore. She basically like calls them out. And her explanations of calling them out are legit. Like She has good reasoning. But she also, she's the one who like tells the rumor of Eleanor having affairs with her students. And you know she uses the fact that they may have been lesbians as something to discredit them. Mm. She like puts down their personalities. Like it's not a fair fight, you know? If you have a skeptical theory, you need to have some reason behind it, not just I don't like you. It should stand on its own, right? Like it should it doesn't need personal slander (laughs) to be legitimate. So the first theory is fully ado, and I hope I'm saying that right. One of them had a delusion, essentially one of them had a dream or a hallucination. And they were so close that they, it happened together. And this could explain a couple things about their experience. It could explain the similar language that they used to describe the event. There's a couple times where they both use very similar. Or identical language. Identical descriptions of what's going on in their supposed separate written accounts, which they include in the book. Two examples. When they approach the scary man, they use the same language to describe how scary he is. And when the boy comes running out of the chapel and they hear the slamming door, they use the same language. Mm -hmm. And that could be that they're just talking about it. And those are the points they covered before they wrote down their individual experiences. But it's weird. I think people in serious relationships or with really close friendships will relate to this. You often pick up the lingo of someone close to you. And so this is something that kind of ties into the theory that, you know, if they were were in a relationship with each other, or even just a very closely devoted friendship, they don't have to be gay for this to be real. Yeah. It's really likely that they might have just picked up on each other's language. This comes from a paper written by Terry Castle, and it was published in 1991 in Critical Inquiry. It's called A Contagious Folly. This is a really popular paper if you look into this incident. She uses this incident as an explanation of fully a dupe. She claims that their close relationship, maybe even a loving relationship, could very well have been the reason that they yeah. had this shared hallucination. 
she doesn't really come to a conclusion. It's it's clear that she's skeptical because she's writing for the critical inquiry. Yeah. But that's a really, really popular theory. I think it's probably the most accepted one is that they, they you know, one of them had a hallucination and they both just jumped into it. And it might have been because they were in a relationship. And that happens. I've heard people get together and experience group craziness of worse things, you know. Mm -hmm. There are people who convince their wives or husbands that somebody's after them and they go on like i'm thinking of a case in australia yes yeah where the family thinks the cia is chasing them or something crazy like they don't even know like what they thought but they all just like took off they go on like week-long road trip or something they throw out all their phones and eventually they just slowly snap out of it and go home they find like one of the daughters like in the back of someone's truck They find the dad like walking down a road and none of them can explain their thinking or anything. I don't even think to this day we have an explanation. We should do a a show about that. That case really rivets me because it's it's like the dancing plague. You're very close to somebody. They start doing something and you're like, oh, well, your monkey brain starts telling you, you have to do it too. You believe it too. Yeah, it, I love stories that basically just come down to, well, my primal brain kicked in and I did this. My brain said conform and I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's plausible. All these are plausible. This is the one I'm leaning to now that we've read it. Mm-hmm. And it starts out very slow and nonchalant. Oh, I see this old plow. Oh, I see this woman. Strange men. Strange woman. <laughs> And it just gets weirder and weirder. It's really interesting. And even Terry Castle, she says, you know, there's no way to know. Because we don't understand the psychological dynamics of their relationship. Yeah. And that's gone now. So we won't know. So the next theory is one of my favorites. In 1965, a biography was written by Philippe Julian about the aristocratic, decadent French poet. It's a quote from Wikipedia. Robert de Montesquieu, he had parties where him and his friends would dress up in period costume and perform tableau vivants as part of party entertainments in Versailles. They kind of imply that he was gay as well. Montesquieu's homosexual tendencies were patently obvious, but he may in fact have lived a chaste life. He had no affairs with women, although in 1876 he reported once slept with great actress Sarah Bernhardt, after which he vomited for 24 hours. (laughs) Yeah, he wasn't gay, but he slept with a woman one time and threw up for a whole day. So Montesquieu is, you know, rumored to have been gay, probably bisexual, because uh, his biographies claim that he had relationships with men and women. They kind of use this as reasoning to explain why his his stories about these tableau vivants and his his groups of friends weren't, you know, in the day of Moberly and Jourdain, he wouldn't have come out and been like, oh, yeah. Me and my closeted friends are in Versailles doing stuff. And they probably wouldn't have told the people at Versailles either. You know, so all these checks that Charlotte and Eleanor are doing at Versailles, they're like, was anyone performing that day? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been on the books. They claim that the Marie Antoinette figure that they have seen could have been a cross-dressing man. And that the pockmarked man may have been Montesquieu himself. So the problem I have... With the theater reenactors, did they have a little girl in their group? True, because there's a young woman. There are three women, and I can believe that they could have good enough costume work to pass, which would be extremely hard because they are walking past a woman sitting at their feet when they think they see Marie Antoinette. They are Mm -hmm. inches away. They're really close to her, yeah. People who endorse this theory kind of say they basically just do the dumb woman explanation. Mm. They're like, they didn't really know what they were seeing. They embellished their stories and they kind of question their research. So I don't really think this is a legit theory. I do think it's super interesting that there was a closeted group of men doing secret tableau vivants in Versailles. Like that's, that would be a cool book in itself. Like, but I don't think it has anything to do. (laughs) Gorilla theater. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think it has anything to do with what happened to Charlotte and Eleanor. So I could write off some of the things 
I could write off them not recognizing the men in costume. Mm-hmm. Maybe one of them had a kid that they brought along and said, hey, hold this yeah. water jug. <laughs> yeah, because like, that'd be fun. Yeah, but like the plows, the stuff they said they couldn't find, like the bridge, the gazebo. It doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain everything. So the last theory is essentially the dumb women theory. <laughs> and it's that they were lost and mistaken. Two women got lost and confused and made all this up. And I have to say, although it is sexist and dumb, it's it's a possibility. It's a possibility that they were just lost and got scared and maybe weren't feeling well that day. Yeah, maybe they had heat stroke and they were just... They both had heat strokes, so they couldn't tell what was going on to either one of them and just went way off the rails. Yeah, I think I said this to you the other day, like... Sometimes when I get hungry and I don't realize that I'm hungry, I start to be like, I hate the world. I want to die. <laughs> Everyone hates me. Like, I get this state of mind that's, like, really gloomy. And it's not depression, but it's it's just, like, this general attitude. Mm-hmm. And then I eat <laughs> and I'm fine again. And I'm not saying that everyone else has this disconnect with their hunger like me. Yeah. but. But that does happen to people, you know, something, it's not maybe not hunger, but something changes your attitude and, and you're not quite in a great place. You know, they are traveling and like vacations are hard on people. I don't know. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's what happened. Yeah. But it, it's a, it's a plausible theory. I think this is what like 90% of people think happened to them and that this is why it's like debunked. I think something happened. I don't think they were just out there lost and confused and... What, they drank a bottle of water and went back to being principals at school? Headmistresses, you know? Yeah, and I have gone on trips or vacations or wherever where, yeah, I'm really unprepared. Yeah. I don't bring cash. I don't bring a water bottle. I don't bring the correct footwear. And by the end, I'm, like, miserable. But I have never gotten so lost and confused that I yeah. convinced myself I saw a bunch of ghosts. See, that's the thing. Like, I stayed up for three days straight. <laughs> in boot camp running around constantly i never once hallucinated mm-hmm. <laughs> i yeah. just can't believe that one morning's walk and suddenly their intelligence is out the window all their reason is mm-hmm. gone yeah and this is a, again a part of like i think the sexism of their time you know and when people are just debunk- debunking them this is the 60s which isn't any better for women's rights and these were two educated women who never mm. married. There, people did have pretty good reason to put them down in yeah. their mind, you know. So let's talk about our theories because we're not skeptics. I'm not entirely skeptical, but... All right, well, you go first. I don't believe it's time travel. I'll just throw that out there. For organization's sake, I think there's really only two non-skeptical theories. And the first is time travel, and mm-hmm. the second is a ghost haunting. Mm-hmm. So you don't think it's time travel? I don't think it's time travel. I think the gardens would have looked much different in the people that were there, in the animals that were running around. And sometimes there's no clear break between them seeing normal people and suddenly they're back in modern day. Other time travel stories that I've heard, granted, it's like, yeah. you know, it's like if you believe any of it, um, there's a catalyst. Exactly. For them changing times. It's not like they go through the stones like an outlander, but something happens. This, it's like they just started walking and somewhere along their path. I mean, they kind of imply that there was like one specific path that looks super spooky. I really think... With the boy walking them around the entire building to the front door where they saw the wedding. Was there some kind of a lightning strike moment where suddenly bright light, loud noise. Oh, we're back. It's a wedding. Let's uh, go to have some tea and go home. On the other hand, you know, maybe just the presence of those people was enough to suck them back into our time. You know? Oh. <laughs> that's it folks <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah I think the time travel theory is a little weak mostly because I think that time travel is a little more 
complex than this. I'm more inclined to believe this is some type of haunting. You know, their theory that they entered Marie Antoinette's memory, I think they're close. You know, I yeah. think that I think that her memories or her spirit very well could be stuck to this place, you know, stone tape theory style about how the environment can soak up feelings yeah. and memories and hauntings. And I think it's really, I think it's more likely that they ran into a bunch of individual ghosts, you know, and I think exactly. Each, I think those gardeners could have been normal people. They gave the wrong direction, so. Exactly, because they're theater people. Okay, <laughs> you're, that's you're what not I'm saying. saying like, they're actual gardeners. Yeah, like I think they were probably just, they might have been theater people and the Tableau Vivant thing. Like maybe that was theater. Maybe the smallpox guy was a real ghost. Yeah. Maybe the Marie Antoinette was, you know, because it's not all or nothing. I do think, like I said earlier, that if anything is, if anyone was likely to haunt the Petit Trianon, it's probably Marie Antoinette, right? Yeah. And they were primed to think about her in the gardens. They were ready yep. for it. And I just think it's it's the most likely that... You know, it's haunted. I mean, even Eleanor, I think, or, you know, one of them was like, we were talking to some friends and everyone was like, oh, yeah, everyone knows that the Petit Trianon is haunted by Marie Antoinette. Because why wouldn't it be? She's this huge, tragic figure. You know, had kind of a miserable life at Versailles. This was her one reprieve. Yeah. I guess I could believe that the first three or four occurrences they have would be a recurrent haunting or something within the land that they see. And it's just a replaying video, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's but it's going to happen whether they're there or not. Exactly. But then the running man comes directly up to them. And that one's strange. And he interacts with them. Yeah, and the little boy is very strange if this is a haunting. That is why I I want, in my perspective of this, I want to divide the experience in half. Yeah. Everything up until they see who they think is Marie Antoinette, I think could very well just be like, you know, a combination of they're lost, they're not feeling well in the August heat, and maybe there's some theater people having fun yeah, with these I'm two to older women. Yeah, I'm willing to discredit it for, for quite a bit of it. But yeah. then... But then they, I mean, the Marie Antoinette and her, her um, resemblance of the painting, that's mm -hmm. freaky. And the, the servant guy who takes them through a building that does not exist. Yeah, or, they take them through a wall. Yeah, where there should be a wall. He yeah. comes out of a door that's has, has a 10-foot drop under it. Yeah. And the reasoning is so sound. Mm -hmm. The reasoning of why that he would do that. And so can a haunting change the physical structure of reality? Right? So like if this is a haunting... That means that whatever these ghosts are or the ghostly environment they're in physically changed a building. I... <laughs> it's crazy. That's the part that's crazy. It's the end is damning. Yeah. The end is absolutely damning for like a skeptic perspective. And this just came to me. Maybe that was their... Maybe that was their like ace in the hole. You that know, could be there. If this is, like, they're trying to prove it, they're like, okay, we're going to say that we walked through a building where there's a wall now, and no one will be able to disprove us because how does that happen, right? I'm not saying that's true. I think it was a haunting. But that means you have to believe, you know? It, yeah. Maybe they, maybe they walked into another reality. And it's not necessarily time travel. It's just a place where things are different. Yeah. There's know. so many possibilities that could be mixed up together. Mm hmm Yeah. Like, some of it could be them embellishing because they want it to be more believable. And maybe they want it to fit the facts they find out later on. Mm-hmm. I... There's a phenomenon... I feel like I talk about Astonishing Legends in every show. But they're <laughs> my favorite... my Probably my most listened to podcast because their catalog is freaking insane they talk about when they're talking about the delphos ring have you heard of that story mm -hmm. yeah they talk about how it's possible that 
you know, someone has an experience. This guy named Ronnie sees a UFO and it's mm-hmm. real. It's real. It happens. And in his desperate attempts to convince people that he's not crazy, that you make up a second more convincing event just yeah. to prove that you're right because you're so desperate to be seen as valid. And it's possible that over the years they added details and change their story just a little bit because they're so desperate yeah. to prove that this is real. Even if the little cottage experience, the first few people they see, before they go into the wood lines and they see Marie Antoinette, that would be a convincing haunting to me. Yeah, that's That it. would be an incredible story. Mm-hmm. But then they make things infinitely more complicated when they see... Marie Antoinette herself, she looks at them. Mm-hmm. They see an altar boy, little boy coming out of a church, whatever you want to call him, <laughs> who directly interacts with them and is like, hey, you don't belong here. Come with me. And they walk through a building that has a wall. <laughs> yeah. they're walking. I don't. There's just so much, so much unsaid, I feel like. I feel like. Yeah. They. We'll never know because it's so far in the past and that's somewhat, that's like frustrating about this, but yeah, I feel like there's probably a lot that they maybe didn't write about their feelings and what they experienced that day that they thought wasn't relevant that we would yeah. think was super important. I really, I came into this thinking that I totally believed their own conclusion. Yeah. This ties into some of my beliefs. As human souls, we kind of share a collective hive mind. And I think that it's super possible to feel each other's emotions and memories and to live each other's thoughts. And the fact that she's dead and she's been dead for like 300 years doesn't matter to me. I think you can totally relive a historical yeah. person's memories, especially when you're walking through their little, you know, nirvana. And so I was inclined to believe that. But the more we talk about just the weird the weird coincidences and how there's so much left out of their stories and so much they don't say. I'm, I'm more inclined to think that it was a good mix of some theater people having a good time, them being lost and a real true haunting. You know, yeah. they really, I, I do think they really did see the ghost of Marie Antoinette and a servant of hers there to keep them out of her hair. Yeah. <laughs> That's just kind of where I end up on this. And I think that maybe in their quest to prove, this story became more embellished along the the years. I don't believe that they did this because they wanted the attention Mm -hmm. and they wanted to make a buck. Way back then, spiritualism consisted of seances, mediums, automatic writing sessions where you just close your eyes and let a spirit take you over. And I can't... I can't see them having this incredible experience and never saying, oh, well, I'm in tune with yeah. ghost and I can see a ghost everywhere. Because if they're trying to hoax it, they'd you'd play to your audience, right? Yeah. So the people that they're trying to convince would be used to other people coming out and saying, yeah, this spirit comes through me and I write this down. or I communicated with this ghost here and there and... This is very unlike anything else that's in popular culture at the time. And I think that gives it a lot of credence. If they had come out later and just been crazy rich psychics, (laughs) I would not believe it at all. Because back then it's so hard to confirm information unless you go directly to the library, you read a million pages. So the fact that they basically spent 10 years writing a book trying to say, This is what we saw. This is what we think happened. Please believe us. To me, that leads to the fact that what they saw, they really genuinely believed. I agree. You know, after this happened, they become so close that Eleanor leaves her school she basically owns, goes to St. Hugh's, works with Charlotte as her vice principal. They end up renting a vacation house together later Mm -hmm. in life where Charlotte spends the last years of her life. I mean, they 
were connected to each other so strongly for the rest of their lives after this. This was very obviously like, I don't want to call it a trauma bond, but it's very much like men who go through warfare together, you know, and they, they have this connection and they both live the rest of their life pretty modestly. Like you said, none of, they didn't become rich. Yeah. They didn't get any fame or fortune from this. If anything, it probably hurt their reputations. And usually if there's two people and somebody's faking something, Mm -hmm. it comes out later down the line once they get in a fight or somebody tells a secret. One of them dies and they're like, well, I guess I'll just... I feel bad. Come out with it. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that too. I mean, there's there's always someone to spill a secret. This is like, I think, Roswell. Like, there were military men. Their lives were threatened and their families' lives were threatened. Don't you ever talk about this. And they still came out and talked about it. Yeah. Because humans cannot keep secrets. We just can't. <laughs> Neither of them ever came yeah. out and were like, yeah, Charlotte made all that up. Or Eleanor. None of their family members came forward and said. Yeah, like, hey, they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She sees ghosts all the time. <laughs> yeah. So to wrap it up, what do you believe? I think they really did see the ghost of Marie Antoinette. I don't know about all of the other people and like weird things they experienced that day yeah but of all the experiences that really hit me emotionally and that I connected with and I think that they backed up in a credible way Mm -hmm. I think that's entirely true and I I really do believe that I mean I believe ghosts exist and I believe they stick to places that are important to them I'd have to go with the combination of haunting and in an attempt to make themselves more credible. Maybe facts got skewed a little, Mm -hmm. but I don't believe this was an all out hoax. Well, something really happened that day in the gardens of Versailles, 121 years ago. That's it for tonight on everything under the moon. Let us know if you've had any interesting experiences in Versailles yourself. We'd love to hear them. If you like our content, support our podcasting endeavors and receive access to exclusive content on our Patreon. Access that at patreon.com slash EUTM. Join our Facebook fan page and group to chat with us about episodes. Get weekly updates and see what we're up to on Instagram. Follow us, like us, rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Good night.